The impoverished nation of Yemen stands on the brink of collapse with the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Three quarters of its 29 million people need humanitarian assistance. There are one million suspected cases of cholera. And 10,000 people have died in a brutal three-year-old civil war causing all the misery. On one side of the war, Shiite Houthi rebels, a religious minority in Yemen, backed by Iran, who now control the capital, Sana'a, and the second largest port city, Hodeidah. On the other side, the government forces of President Abdu Rabo Mansour Hadi, and a coalition led by Saudi Arabia, which includes the United Arab Emirates and the United States. A Saudi-led air campaign has pounded Houthi strongholds in the north and cut off aid and food, driving many people south, homeless in their own land. Tonight, with the support of the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, special correspondent Marsha Biggs reports. It's being called the Forgotten War. In Yemen, a country where access for journalists is limited and dangerous, the world's worst humanitarian crisis goes largely ignored. But after months of waiting, we were able to get permission to enter the country through the southern city of Aden, the new de facto capital of Yemen's government controlled by the Saudi-led coalition. We were hoping to get to areas under siege, but kept hitting a wall. So it's incredibly difficult to access the northern Houthi-controlled areas to cover what's going on there. Even if you can secure permission from the Houthis, it's getting there that's the problem. The airport in Sana'a is shut. There is one flight from Djibouti for humanitarian staff, but the Saudis control who gets on that flight. And right now they're not giving permission to journalists. You could drive, but it's very dangerous and there's no guarantee that you'll actually reach the destination, that you won't get turned around halfway there. So we went to a village called Basatin on the outskirts of Aden to try to tell the story as best we could. So since we can't get to the north, to the Houthi-controlled areas, we're going to talk to some people that have recently arrived to find out what life is like there. Marhaba. Living in this one room Marhaba. are Sawad, her two sons, and daughter-in-law. Sawad says she fled daily airstrikes near her home in Hodeida one month ago, but the lack of food was worse than the bombs. Life is difficult there. People are hungry. They're looking for water, looking for food, looking for work, but there is nothing. We would eat once a day. If we had breakfast, that's it for the day. If we had lunch, that's it for the day. Lots of diseases have spread there. Children are getting malaria, their platelets are low. They are very sick because of the lack of food. Areas here in the south are, quote, liberated from Houthis and far from the front line. So people may be safe from the fighting, but they still face the daily threat of starvation. Here in Aden, it's a big city. Food is available. The problem, the prices. We spoke to one shopkeeper who told me that a bag of flour three months ago cost $10. Now it costs 17 But Sawad is living outside of Aden, where food and money are even harder to come by. She says her son makes around $3 a day as a laborer, but work is sporadic. When they have money, food is the first thing they try to find. So there's some vegetables. No meat. No bread. Just the vegetables. Who do you blame? God help us with this situation. We don't know who caused it or who to blame. They are both fighting. I don't know. Yemen was already the poorest country in the Middle East before the war. But in 2015, Houthi rebels supported by Iran captured huge areas of the country. And the existing government made a deal with Saudi Arabia to fight the Houthis, driving them back north, where Saudi Arabia and a coalition which includes the United States has pounded the Houthis with bombs and tried to choke their supplies with a blockade. Amid international outrage, some U.S. lawmakers have sought to stop the flow of money and weapons to Saudi Arabia. But the Trump administration recently approved a deal to sell the Saudis $1.3 billion worth of weapons. Ahmed bin Ahmed al Maisri is Yemen's interior minister, a cabinet member of embattled and exiled President Abdul Rabo Mansour Hadi. How does it make you feel that Yemeni people in the north are being bombed and are starving in the name of fighting the Houthis? 
هل في حرب في العالم ما فيش حد فيها يموت؟ Is there a war in the world where people don't die? War is a disaster on all levels. هي كارثة بكل المقاييس. We didn't start this war. We were dragged into it. They came, supported by Iran, to take over our identity and doctrine that we've had for 1400 years. عندما تفرض علينا الحرب. When war is imposed on you, you have to fight back. يعني أن نستعد لها. But the cost of that fight is high. So people are trying to set up home as best they can in the circumstance. You can see clothes hanging on the line. People are using these plastic sheets to, for a sense of privacy. Shabi Amantu um, is with the United Nations Refugee in Agency. In the past three months alone, we've seen more than 100,000 people have to flee their homes. This former vocational center outside of Aden is now home for displaced Yemenis. And 33 families are crammed in this building, having just arrived from the front line. Missiles hit our house and it was totally destroyed. The bathroom was the only place left standing. 17-year-old Rosela fled with her elderly aunt, with only the clothes on their backs. They had to leave her mother and father behind. I'm very worried about them, and I call them when I can. If we find something, at least if we find mattresses, we will stay. You're not just dealing with displacement, we're also dealing with an active conflict zone. It makes getting assistance to them quite challenging. He's struggling to keep up. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at the numbers, 22 million people in need and humanitarian assistance is only finite. It requires more than humanitarian solution. It's caused by a political problem and the solution to that is peace. 27-year-old El Sam is the wife of a fisherman from Yemen's western coast. We ate once a day. We were under siege. We could not get anything. All we had was what we could catch in the sea. But they're now living 20 miles inland, so supporting the family is difficult, especially with a daughter coping with epilepsy. We have to drive two hours now to bring her seizure medicine. It's not available around here. We try our best to provide the medicine for her every 10 days, but it's very expensive. For those most vulnerable, it's hardship after hardship. Yemen has historically imported 90% of its food, so restrictions on imports are a huge blow. Fuel shortages, inflation, and rising unemployment are crippling the country. So we're dealing with a situation in Yemen where you've got state services that are now on the brink of collapse. The health system is really buckling. Families are struggling to make the choice of deciding which child to feed, which child to send to hospital. I mean, these are really heartbreaking decisions, but this is what life is like for civilians now impacted by war in Yemen. Here in this small regional hospital in Lahish province, just north of Aden, Dr. Marwa Gamal says she sees around a dozen children per month with severe acute malnutrition, all of them with complications. Ten-month-old Mohammed was already malnourished when he contracted measles and bronchopneumonia. His mother said when she brought him in, she thought he was dying. His eyes were closed and he wasn't breathing, she says. Is the biggest problem malnutrition or disease? Disease. Malnutrition is controllable if there are no complications. But when they come with diseases, this is much worse. There are cases that died. We could not help them because they came too late. They died because of complications. Like many public sector employees, Dr. Gamal continues to work despite an intermittent salary. I love my work. This hospital is in my village. If I don't help my own people, who am I going to help? Are you concerned about what will happen when they leave? Yes, yes, of course. I'm worried that the children will get worse or get sick again if the parents don't follow the proper course of treatment. A cycle of displacement, malnutrition and disease brought on not by famine or natural disaster, but by man. Is there a point when you would say, enough, Yemeni people are suffering, we have to find another way? War will not end until its mission ends, and in the past three years we paid a lot. There is still a little bit left to pay, and we have to pay it, so that the bill is completed and the mission is done. The blood we lost can't go for nothing. To let this blood go in vain and surrender means we've neither achieved the mission nor saved lives. They should never have started it, but now we're on this journey, and we have to finish it. We were poor before the war, one woman told me, but the war just finished us. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Marsha Biggs in Aden and Lahij, Yemen. And Marsha Biggs will be back tomorrow with the next part of her series, Inside Yemen.